This um, talk will be about um, a study that I finished recently, which is called Artificial Vocal Learning Guided by Phoneme Recognition and Visual Information. And this is part of the eVocalearn project, and it is basically intended to <clears throat> um, yeah, study the impact of visually accessible information, such as lip movements or jaw movements um, of speech. Um, and to test if this information um, can, can be beneficial during um, the simulation of vocal learning. <clears throat> First, I want to de define the, the term artificial vocal learning. So um, this um, is about the acquisition of motor states in a certain motor space. They correspond to some acoustic information that preserves um, a certain communicative intent. <clears throat> that means it's not about imitating an utterance directly um, in order to sound the same way, but it's about imitating um, an utterance in a way so that others still understand um, the same intent. And that makes it different for example, from copy synthesis, which was presented earlier by Sen, where you basically directly imitate um, an utterance. And this process is um, semi-supervised or unsupervised, which means that we can only learn from observables. Um, as Anshi pointed out earlier, um, the most prominent observable is the acoustic information. Um, but then there's also uh, like visual information, we can observe that. But most of the other articulate, uh, articulators, they are hidden. So <clears throat> what are the differences um, oh, uh, between this work and, and the previous um, work presented by Daniel and Anshi? So first of all, um, it, it's using a slightly different framework with a different impl implementation. Um, even though the, the basic idea is the, the same. So we're using um, phoneme recognition as um, the as a mechanism to, to create an objective for the optimization. But in this case, I'm using single phoneme recognition instead of syllable-based recognition um, because it's a bit more flexible because we can use it um, in order to create vowels. We can also use it in order to create syllables or even words by basically shifting the window that um, so that the single phoneme recognition recognizes a phoneme within a certain window and then we can basically shift this window across an utterance and um, this way we can um, uh, you yeah, have basically multiple phoneme losses in our optimization so it's quite flexible it also has some disadvantages but i will get to those in the end, maybe. Um, the phoneme recognizer was trained on a full set of German phonemes, which is about 40 phonemes. Um, and it was used in this study to create um, or to simulate <clears throat> eight German vowels, which are the tense vowels, um, A, E, I, O, U, E, Ö, and Ü. And um, almost uh, all the German consonants with a few exceptions. Um, and yeah, um, like I said, the, the main goal is to study the influence of visual information. Um, so it includes uh, like the measurement of, of some visual parameters from video recordings and the transfer of this information onto the simulation. And it provides a, a bit more in-depth analysis of the articulatory distributions that were obtained during the optimization um which is also quite interesting so the framework <clears throat> um that i used looks like this and i will explain it step by step um so we uh on the left side we have that's basically the core of the um framework that's the optimizing agent which consists of um, an optimization algorithm which is in this case called the uh, whale optimization um which was just chosen because it um you know, uh, performed uh, very well. Um, 
Uh, we'll get to that later. But what this algorithm does, it basically it provides an articulatory state. That's the state that we want to optimize. And it gets um, an input, which is a loss value. Um, and based on this loss value, it will generate new articulatory states. So <clears throat> then um, this articulatory state is processed in a, a forward loop. Um, first, it is checked if it fulfills um, some uh, con constraints. So um, if that state, if, if we, for example, if we want to create a vowel, we want that um, tube area function to be open of that state. That means that we have no constriction. If we want to create um, a plosive, for example, we want a closure somewhere. So if that's not fulfilled, then it will directly um, pass back a higher loss value and um, the loop will be closed already. But if that constriction is fulfilled, we will um, actually calculate a um, motor score from that using um, the and in, in order to control the vocal track lab forward model and produce some um, audio with it. And then this um, audio signal is passed to, a, to the phoneme recognition model, which um, gives us a probability uh, output, uh, which is compared against um, a preset class that we want to optimize for. And um, we calculate the cross entropy categorical cross entropy from those two vectors. Um, and that's basically the loop of the baseline. So without visual information, if we also use visual information in the simulation, then we would extract the three visual parameters um, of the articulatory state vector, which is the, the jaw angle, JA, the lip protrusion, which um, controls the lip rounding, um, and lip spreading, which is called LP, and the lip distance, which is just the, the vertical, you know, like the, the openness of the lips, um, which is called LD. And we compare that against um, like values that we um, externally measured from some video recordings. Um, so before I continue, I just wanted to show how we came up with a, a whale optimization. Here, um, we actually tested um, so that the framework is designed um, in, a, in a black box fashion. So we can just exchange the uh, optimization algorithm. So we don't depend on a single uh, algorithm. We can just exchange it. And this is what I did. I tested 15 different um, like state of the art meta heuristic algorithms. And then um, on the right, you can see the five best performing algorithms. And I saw that the, the whale optimization um, produce the lowest um, phoneme losses here in, um, uh, in some optimizations um, of, of vowels, um, while also being the fastest in terms of computation time. So um, this is why it was selected. <clears throat> um, then this framework was was used to to produce, um, yeah. Um, like, like I said, the, the vowels and, and the sets of, of consonants. And these consonants were in the uh, CV context um, and the context vowel would be R. Um, like I said, uh, I measured some, some visual parameters. For these purposes, um, I recorded a video data corpus where um, a speaker would utter these, these vowels and also these um, syllables. And then um, I would use uh, landmark facial landmark detection, which is um, basically using neural network to fit these um, outlines of, of the jaw and of the lips. Um, and then from these um, values, I calculate basically the distance, like the opening of the mouth and the, the spreading of the mouth uh, of, of the lips and um, the jaw angle by measuring the distance between the, the jaw and the nose, basically. And then um, I would normalize this to the vocal track lab scale by using a minimum maximum uh, normalization. So the, the subject that was recorded would, oh, like, we would record them the maximum positions, like 
um, fully open mouth, fully closed mouth, and then uh, we could um, transfer that onto the work track left scale, even though it's it's a bit tricky, but um, it can be done. And then um, we can basically calculate these distances frame by frame, and we would get trajectories, um, even though in this case we are interested more in the um, static parameters because um, we are optimizing um, single states. So for the vowels, we would just use the average of these trajectories. And then for the for consonants, we would use the um, extreme positions. Like um, if you have something like bar, um, the lip distance would be um, minimal during the, the consonants. And then this would be a value um, that we would use. And um, here is a plot um, for the vowels, um, for the, yeah, basically the, the measured visual parameters for the vowels. Um, <clears throat> and you can see, for example, the, the R has um, uh, like a, a large negative jaw angle. That means that the jaw is very open, uh, which is reasonable. And the lip distance is um, quite large. That means we have like, like a very open vowel. And the lip protrusion is um, around zero, which is a neutral value. Um, if you look at A e and E, for example, it, it becomes negative, which means uh, these vowels uh, uh, have lip spreading, um, like A e and E. Uh, and um, the opposite is, is true for O and U, where you have a rounding, like, um, and then uh, the lip protrusion value uh, becomes close to one. So these um, values are reasonable, and then the, the mean values are used in the simulations. Um, the experiments uh, were done as uh, follows. <clears throat> I did a 100 runs uh, for each phoneme, um, and in each run, we would have 1,000 synthesis steps involved. Um, and this was done for like without the visual parameters and with the visual, visual parameters. Um, and generally, I would optimize for 16 um, supraglottal parameters. Um, that uh, that's basically all the 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 folk track layer parameters without TRX and TRY because they can be calculated automatically. And I also do not optimize the VLIM opening because that dimension is only um, required if we want to uh, create nasal sounds. And this is why we have 17 parameters in, in case of the nasals, because then we need it, of course. But uh, otherwise, we can just uh, leave the VLIM closed. And then the, the, we also have glottis uh, parameters um, in, in our glottis model that um, Peter previously presented. Um, these were fixed to, to a modal voice. Um, I have a plot here on the lower um, right corner where you can see that um, if we optimize the glottal settings on average, in, in case of the vowels, we will end up with a modal voice. But very often, we also end up with um, very uh, noisy or breathy sounds. Which we want to avoid because um, yeah, the, the glottis just has a huge effect on the um, naturalness of, of the um, utterances, and um, it can also mess up things. So it's easier to just fix that to, to a model voice. And then for the voiceless um, sounds, of course, we uh, um, have a slightly open glottis uh, with a um, negative uh, relative amplitude, so we get a uh, voiceless sounds. Um, and in the in the uh, plot on the right top corner, you can see that's the loss curve. Um, that's the phoneme loss curve of both uh, experiments. So uh, without the visual information, that's the baseline, and the, with visual information, and you can see that the um, phoneme loss with visual information is. Um, consistently actually higher uh, than the um, than the one of the baseline, and that 
um, shows that it's basically um, a kind of regularization. So um, if um, when we look at the results, it's important to um, actually um, not only look at the, the best results from each run, but we um, it's actually important to understand that we um, uh, get a, a whole distributions of solution um, because um, yeah we, we don't um, find a single solution during optimization but um, we find many states where the recognizer actually says um, this is the correct category and I save all the states and in the end we can look at the articulatory distribution this is what you see here on the right um, you can see um, these are um, the distributions of states where the recognizer recognized the um, category, the, the vowel E. And um, you can see that these um, distributions have multiple peaks. That means we find multiple different solutions. Um, uh, that, and that's uh, very interesting. Um, but also makes it very difficult to um, select an, an optimal solution. So we can um, only, what, what I did here is I basically looked at the total loss and then I selected solutions just based on this error. But it's something for future work um, to actually make use of this articulate distributions and maybe um, find like more plausible solutions by, by making use of these. Um, but based on, on the uh, total loss, I selected um, a few samples that I wanted to test in a perception experiment. And what I did is um, I calculated the five quantiles, Q10 up to Q00. And what, what this is, is basically Q10 means that's the sample that has the highest loss. So it's basically the worst sample. Um, and Q00 is the, the best one, and Q0.5 would be the median. Um, so I select that from, from each phoneme category, I selected those samples. Um, and then I also did a, a manual selection that is called M. Um, there I listened to the, like I, like I said, I made 100 runs for each phoneme, and then I would listen to the, the best, like the sample with the lowest arrow from each run. Um, and the one that sounded best to me um, were selected in, in this manual category. And then we also have another category that's called VTL. Um, this is the, so, so the vocal track lab comes with um, predefined vocal track shapes that correspond to the German phonemes. These are derived from MRI data and they are um, known to be um, intelligible and to a certain degree natural. Um, I used these shapes to uh, synthesize um, like a strong baseline in order to co compare um, our samples against these in a listening experiment. This listening experiment was carried out with 20 German native listeners and they evaluated this um, stimuli in, in a multiple choice scenario. So you would basically hear um, a vowel and then you could select one of the vowels or you could select um, like I didn't understand. And um, the same was done with the syllables. And what you can see is that um, in this, uh, quantile samples from Q10 to Q00 is as a um, trend. And the, um, the pink bars are the baseline and the, the white bars are the samples with visual information. And um, in, in both um, cases, you can see that there's a trend. So the recognition rate um, goes from, from low to high which is um, expected and it validates the metric, it validates the um, recognizer loss basically. Um, <clears throat> and we can see that in the, for the best samples that were selected, 
based on the errors, we can see recognition rates of um, around 75% for the baseline and 84% for the visual samples. And then the manual selection is um, has a very high recognition rate about 97% and 95% or 94%, um, which even outperforms the, the vocal track lab um, strong baseline, which is uh, around 88% recognition rate. And um, I can quickly show you some. Um, so I brought as ex ex examples, I brought the manually selected group, which represents basically the highest quality that we uh, can achieve with this kind of simulation. Uh, e, e, o, u, e, u. U, ba, da, ga, pa, ta, ka, fa, va, za, la, ja, ya, pa, la, cha, ma, na, la. So they are um, very, uh, yeah, very intelligible. But like I said, manually selected. Um, and uh, yeah, I didn't um, show you the, the visual samples because they sound very similar. That's that's also what we see in the um, listening experiment. We don't see um, it, it, uh, a significant difference in the um, intelligibility of the the baseline and the visual samples, which is interesting. Uh, Sorry. He But we see um, a difference between the baseline and the visual samples uh, in their articulatory distributions. Um, for example, you can this is um, these are three dimensions, um, three articulatory dimensions um, of the vowel e, um, and you can see um, in the in the baseline configuration, uh, for example, we have an unnatural um, shape of the uh, jaw angle distribution because that peaks at very low um, values, which means fully open jaw. Um, while it is possible to create like an E uh, that is that open, it uh, you can try it out. It will feel very uncomfortable and very inconvenient, probably because it um, yeah costs a lot of effort to do that. And but the model doesn't care about effort; it doesn't know effort. So um, um my guess is that in order to to have a clear uh sounding well it just prefers um open very open jaw angle all the time but we can see if um uh yeah we constrain it using the additional visual input then um uh yeah we get the value which is um more natural and it's very close to where the vocal track lab preset um, sits actually, which is interesting. And this is to, to, to a certain degree expected for the visual dimensions because we, we measure those and we put them into the simulation. But we also see that other dimensions are affected. For example, in, in this case, you can see there's TCX, which um, has previously basically no peak at around 2.5, but um, in the visual uh, runs, we uh, suddenly see that there emerges um, that is a solution emerges around 2.5, and that's exactly where the vocal track lab preset, which is uh, yeah, a natural shape, um, where it uh, lives. So this is very interesting, and I wanted to see um, if we can see a pattern across all phonemes. Um, so I looked into this, but um, before I show you the results, I want to also mention that it's um, not all the book track lab dimensions are equally important. So there are dimensions which have a huge impact on the tube area function, like TCX, but there are also dimensions that have very low impact and they um, 
you know, we, we don't really care if we are close to the VTL preset layer, um, if it doesn't really have a huge impact. So <clears throat> what I first did, I, I um, wanted to find out what are the most important dimensions. And in order to find that out, I trained a neural network forward model that would map the articulatory states to the category that we were optimizing for. Um, and then I um, calculated the feature importance by basically randomly shuffling the input matrix and see how the um, accuracy, the prediction accuracy decreased. And um, I um, grouped the um, articulatory states into um, like vowels, plosives, voiceless, pl uh, voice plosive, voiceless plosive, fricatives, voiceless fricatives, nasals, and um, all of them together, um, and trained separate models. And then I would calculate the important dimensions and I would um, figure out which uh, dimensions are important by um, basically ordering the uh, them after the um, accuracy decrease. And then I would calculate the knee point in that curve, which is the point of the highest curvature. And um, all dimensions below that would be the important ones, and the other one uh, would not count as important. And we can see that in all cases, TCX was the, the most important dimensions, which is reasonable because it has a huge impact on the tube error function. But we can also see that the other visual parameters are important and that like tongue tip, TTX and TTY um, are also important in, in most cases. Then if we look um, finally at the, so I would calculate the, the mean absolute error between the baseline distribution and the VTL presets and the, the visual distributions and the VTL presets. And then I would divide um, the visual uh, mean absolute error by the baseline absolute error. So we get a coefficient. If that is below 1.0, <clears throat> that means that on average, the visual um, distributions are closer to the VTL presets. And um, if it's above 1.0, then it's the other way around. And on this table, we can see that um, for TCX, we can see that it's below 1.0 for the vowels, but not for the other groups. And um, for if we do that for all the important dimensions, we can see it's below 1.0 in most cases. For the visual dimensions um, and average across all dimensions, it's always below 1.0. Um, which brings me to, to the conclusion. So we have, um, or I've made following key results that single phoneme recognition provides a sufficient mechanism uh, for successful simulation of vocal learning, which was demonstrated by um, generating highly intelligible utterances, which could even outperform the vocal track lab baseline. Um, <clears throat> and the second um, key result is that the visual information um, is not necessary to produce very intelligible utterances, but it can act as a regular uh, regularization mechanism that provides us more biological plausible solutions um, on the articulatory level. And then in the future work is that we need to find um, ways to actually select uh, all best samples in a in an automatic way because it seems that only the error of the recognizer may be not be enough.